Hey, this is Greg Berger, and you are listening to the Geek Cast Radio Network. Recently, I got a very disturbing call. <laughs> Crimea had been taken. I hate it when things are taken. During the crisis, the United States and the European Union have been more than fair. But a man like Putin doesn't listen to reason. He'd rather ride in a motorcycle gang or get photographed shirtless on a horse. So I want to give President Putin a personal message from me. Mr. Putin, Vladimir, I've never met you. I don't have experience in international diplomacy, but what I do have is a very particular set of skills. Skills that would make me a nightmare for someone like you. By which I mean, I'm an actor in Hollywood with a lot of connections. You are now on the inside of what I like to call the circle of trust. We are all connected in the great circle of life. You know something, Bert? What? I think you and I are going in circles. It feels like we're going in circles. The circle is now complete. When I left you, I was but the learner. Now I am the master. Because it's a circle. Yeah, we heard about the circle. Yes, we're yeah. familiar with shapes. Hi, this is Chuck. This is Greg. And this is Dan. And we are Talking in Circles, brought to you by the Geek Cast Radio Network, the podcast where you are definitely talking to you. For those joining us for the first time or those return visitors, like I mentioned, we are Talking in Circles. And we begin each podcast with a roundabout discussion of what we've been up to in the past week or so. And then for segment two, we have different games or different things we like to play. And Greg actually has a little bit of game up his sleeve for us. And it's called The Power of Names. And it just kind of goes right off its title. And he'll be giving us different names and different titles of superhero characters for this time. And we'll be trying to determine if those characters are in fact real and if they're fictional and determining exactly what are their powers. What is Superman's power? What is Strong Guy's power? But actually crazy names that we've probably never heard of. So should be fun, should be interesting. Should, Anyways, before we get to all that stuff, how are things with all you guys out there? Not too bad. I am sporting a new microphone, so pretty excited about that. Hopefully I sound a lot better than I have in all the previous episodes. I think you sounded great as John Madden, though. <laughs> <laughs> you should just do that constantly. You didn't need a new microphone. You just needed to uh, do John Madden the entire time. Wow, mate, boom! That's a new <laughs> microphone! <laughs> <laughs> Funny, you have a John Madden button, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just, yeah, I push it, and it, the light goes red. That's the Madden mode. So. <laughs> How did that happen then last week? <laughs> <laughs> Explains when we go over to your ha- uh, your house and we see your computer and then just a bunch of lines on it, like you've been writing on it. <laughs> Boom! Awesome. Greg, how are things going for you? Uh, pretty good, pretty good. Uh, just got home from uh, a visit to the chiropractor to fix my crooked ass back and neck and spinal uh, cord, which is total disaster. Sounds painfully awesome. Uh, oh, it's it's not painful to go to the chiropractor, let me tell you. That's a, a big misconception. When he cracks it, you, you get the crack, snapple, uh, crack, yeah, snapple. Mm-hmm. Crack, snapple, uh, and pop. It's like... <laughs> yeah. You get a fun uh, fact under the cap? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he spins he spins my head off, and he looks up into my head, and he sees the little fun fact inside. Um, <laughs> no, he cracks it. You hear and feel the crack, but it, it's not a, a painful thing, it, and it actually feels a lot better after you're done. It feels a little weird at first. It kind of takes a little time to get used to, and after a couple of visits, you kind of get back to normal. I usually go for about four, and then I'm good for a, about a year or more, so I'm kind of feeling pretty good i got a couple more visits to go before i'm back to myself very nice nice Uh, my week has been pretty normal though i did get pulled over the other day on the way home from uh, dinner from i had to go to this dinner after work and luckily i it wasn't for like anything major i had a taillight out but the cop was like the nicest cop i've ever got pulled over by oh my god sir are you all right (laughs) are you okay do you need me to hold your hand as you drive home sir no, he he didn't do that, but he he was just very like I guess 
you know, Baltimore police, they have, a, they deal with a lot of stuff. So, you know, they cannot be the most energetic people in the world, but he was just really happy. He's like, just to let you know, I, you know, I'm pulling out, you didn't do anything wrong. You just have a taillight out. And I didn't try to fight it because I knew it was out. I just haven't fixed it yet. So, but he was, he wasn't a jerk about it. He just kind of got it done. He's like, you know, he called me buddy. So that's kind of <laughs> cool. So you made a new friend. I did. I did. I asked for his number, but he, he wouldn't, he wouldn't give it to me. So <laughs> I get that a lot with uh, both genders. So. <laughs> I was pulled over by a really nice cop one time too. It was uh, down in State College, and uh, he's like, "Oh, you know, you were speeding back there." I'm like, "Oh, I'm, I'm really sorry. I I didn't even realize I was doing it." He's like, "Oh, no problem. It's okay." He's like, "I do it too." <laughs> 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 and then he gave me a ticket. I'm like, "What the freak?" <laughs> It's like the nicest guy, and then it's like, bam, ticket. Monkey see, monkey don't do. <laughs> yeah. I, I luckily didn't get a ticket. He just gave me a work order to get a fix. So that's kind of, <laughs> I do that's, that too. That's the most they usually, they usually do for that kind of stuff. I love how you guys both had nice uh, visits from the cop. Whereas I had a, a visit from a cop and he was just kind of indifferent the whole time. <laughs> I've had both. I noticed that usually like Baltimore City cops, if it's not a big thing, they're dealing with real issues. So they're not going to get that bent out of shape over something stupid. But I got pulled over by a statey once on like the Turnpike in PA. It was like a Monday morning. I was coming home from Kutztown. I was going like 10 miles over the speed limit. There was no one else on the road. He was just like, like having yelling at me for speeding. I'm like, I'm going 75 and a 65. I'm like, let's let's calm down here for a moment. Yeah, you'll have that. His wife kicked him in the balls the night before, probably <laughs> <laughs> taking yeah, on you the next day. I think it was the hat. I think the hat just like, you know, this looks like it hurts the chin. I don't know. <laughs> oh, he had one of those that straps under. Yeah, yeah. Oh, those look painful. Yeah. Uh, but, I don't know why they do that. It's not like he's playing football or something. <laughs> he's the chin strap. I don't know. But also this week, I actually had a quite a busy week. If you're on geekcastradio.com at all, you'll see I've, I've been really slacking in reviews with podcasting and whatnot. I actually haven't had a lot of time to watch movies and write about them. But this past week, I, I had some more time, a little bit more time, and some I've been working on for quite a while. And one movie I saw, I don't know if you guys saw this, but you know, Liam Neeson is kind of a cult hero for all of us. And so I, I got to see nonstop. Did nice, any of you guys get nice. to see that yet? No, no, I haven't gotten to see it. You know, it's that classic movie with Liam Neeson with a special set of skills like he always does. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't the hugest fan of it. It was OK. I couldn't really recommend it per se. I think the biggest issue is that it just really falls apart near the end. And there are all these like twists and turns that really don't really amount to much. And, you know, with something like Taken, it's kind of like a lot of, like a lot of action, a lot of tense moments happening. Nonstop didn't really have that. If you saw the movie Unknown that Neeson did a few years ago, it's directed by the same guy who did that. So it's more in the vein of that. So I, I would say skip it. Not something you need to see in theater. So I know. He's like the king of the box office right now with all his movies, and he he has some good ones, but this one I would I think it's better than Taken Two, but I would say besides that, his like new career renaissance is not all that great. Is it better than Dark Man? I have not seen Dark Man, so I'm not sure. <laughs> Don't see it, Dan. <laughs> uh, it's not better than Schindler's List, so I mean, <laughs> it's a completely different movie. And Did you see the uh, the SNL skit that Liam Neeson was on recently? No, I haven't. It was like it was supposed to be him and President Obama, and they were kind of sending this like tough guy message to uh, Vladimir Putin. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. And like he does the whole taken speech where he kind of leans on the desk and he's like, it's like, Mr. Putin, I don't know who you are. <laughs> I've never met you. <laughs> and he goes on with like the particular set of skills, and it's pretty funny. That's, I also saw the skit of him in uh, was Life Too Short or something like that, the one HBO show with the guy who was from willow but he's trying to be like a stand-up comic comic and he's talking about he's like doing a list it's like i really like making lists uh you know that's why i got that part in that movie it was, just <laughs> like, it was really awkward seeing him in that but uh he was actually really funny too in the lego movie that came out earlier the year he did a voice of it and he was good cop and bad cop and bad cop was like you know the normal neeson but good cop was like him super giddy with really high-pitched voice and it was so God creepy it was <laughs> it was funny anyways the other thing i i saw that i really want want to talk about is long long time ago a few episodes ago we talked about our favorite tv shows and i did my top five not to sound hyperbolic but after the season of true detective i might change that list a little bit because that season of television was to me like one of the best seasons i've seen 
uh, for those that don't know what it is, it's a it's a cop show, I guess, serial killer cop show starring Matthew McConaughey, M- McConaughey or McConaughey, and hey, <laughs> all right, all right, all right, all right, uh, <laughs> Matthew McConaughey and Woody Harrelson, and they're basically two cops, and it's two stories kind of going together, one 17 years ago and one now, and they're basically going after this serial killer per se, and. The setup is there, like you think you'd seen before, but they really play with a lot of, of the cop show tropes that you're used to. But it's also just really well done. There's so much to it. Like, I got, I've got i gone online and, and looked up all the theories of everything that goes into the, the play in this movie. It's just crazy. It also really looks fantastic. It, it's really shot well. And the acting is phenomenal. Like, I'm pretty sure McConaughey is going to come away with an Emmy for his performance. And Woody Harrelson, too, is really good. But it goes in a lot of directions you're not expecting. And there's this really particular great moment in episode four, I think. I, I don't know for sure. But it's a six-minute unbroken take. That's like this action set piece where the, they never cut. So it's just the camera moving for six minutes from moment to moment. And it's, it's really done well. In a lot of ways, like the best movie I've seen all year. Because it's only eight episodes. So it feels more like a movie, more so than a TV show. Just the way it's looked and the way it's done. So I really want to see it again because there's so much involved in it. There's so much symbolism. There's so much imagery that i'm you can really pick apart so i, I won't go, go back and see it again i know it's probably not for everyone I, i'm really building up i could see a lot of people not liking it because it's a little bit slow it's a little bit it can get kind of crazy with some of its existential dialogue and stuff like that but i really loved it and i was super impressed with each episode and the finale really paid off in a good way you think it's going to go a certain direction it's it's not really fair uh, afraid to kind of not solve everything and not, not clean everything up really nice and pretty isn't the the long one continuous shot like a uh, director's porn? Because anytime I've watched like uh, special features, behind the scene commentary type stuff, they're always going for oh, it's so amazing. We've got this one long continuous shot, and that's like always like one of those amazing things that they've accomplished in the movie. Like even watching the commentary for like a movie like Waiting, which wasn't that great of a movie. I kind of liked it, but. Uh, there was one shot that was a long continuous shot that he was the guy, the director was just so happy that he got this one continuous shot. So isn't it like a, a director's type of porn to get that one <laughs> continuous shot? It is it, depending on who's doing it. Sometimes it's the director, sometimes it's the cinematographer and they're, I mean, not all the continuous shots are made the same. I, I would say some are a little bit more complicated than others. And it is, some it, of them are special <laughs> our hearts in our dreams. Well, there's some are like with the camera work in general and just in how much it's involved. Like one of the most iconic ones is, is in Goodfellas. Uh, in the scene where he basically goes to the club, like he he skips the line, he goes in the back, and basically, and a lot of done is done in that scene. Even like characterization of the of, of that world is done just through that one shot. And a lot of people point to that as one of the best long shots of all time. You I mean think. the one in waiting isn't? No, uh, it's second actually. It's second. Oh, okay, uh, <laughs> good, good, good. But yeah, it, it is pretty director's point, and a lot of people don't really care about it. But when you see one done really well, it is pretty impressive. It's it's something that you kind of behold. Like Gravity has a really great one to start the, mo- the movie. Like Afonso Cuaron is really known for his. Like in Children of Men, they have a few really. And it's just because of all the little pieces, because especially with there's like an explosion that has to go up. It's just like this gigantic dance that has to go exactly right for it all to work. And when you see it done really well, it, it works I had a perverted joke in there. <laughs> I'm not going to say it. On Greg, Chuck's behalf, I won't say it. I want to throw in something I know you guys can can chime in on. Because I think, Greg, you even saw this, too, based upon the, the comments on the, on the message, on the GeekCast radio post. But you talked about it last week, Chuck, and that's Turtles Forever. Yes, oh, I yeah. did see that. It was yeah. really good. Also, when I was uh, editing the podcast, I was looking for cl- clips because I wanted to play that clip in the beginning. If you haven't seen- listened to the last episode, go back and check that out. I found it on YouTube, too, and I was like... I got started watching it and like you, Chuck, I kind of just got into it really well and I really dug it. It was it was really good. It was kind of interesting going in with all the you said about it because I was I picked it up (laughs) really well. Like I love the moment, like you mentioned, with the comic book hurdles when they're doing the dialogue in the narration and stuff like that. The action's really well. I I do feel like I I was really confused, though, with like the new shredder and why he was kind of like a Krang character too i, I guess. was confused by that too but i yeah. figure i figure that's more with that that turtle series there and he looked like one of the weird little characters from the pac-man game <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the ghosts yeah. yeah 
And I did want to comment one thing, and I think someone even mentioned this uh, about on the episode post last week, and that was the way it, it treated like the '80s turtles, and it did feel like the, peop- the people who made that movie had an issue with those turtle, <laughs> the turtle cartoon from the '80s, because they really made them into really big punks and uh, almost like a big gigantic joke, almost like everyone was Michelangelo in a way. Pretty I, much, yeah. And, and I, I mean, I know like back then it was a little bit more goofy; it wasn't as serious. And from what I remember, like even like Leonardo and those characters would get serious when the mo- right moment came. And yeah. yeah, Raphael was an emo character. So yeah. Yeah. I mean, so that, that kind of bugged me a little bit, like, especially I think you mentioned it, Chuck with the one moment when they run away with their weapons, when the, when the comic turtles come up and I'm like, that's a little bit much. And yeah, that would never happen. They, they don't run from a fight. Yeah. And that, that, that kind of bugged me. It hugely bugged me. Cause I guess it was just what they were going for, but uh, I thought it was really good, but Greg, it sounds like you liked it as well. I did. I uh, looked it up on YouTube as well, and I started watching it, and I just kind of got engrossed. And uh, by the end of the movie, I was like, I really want to get the old cartoons and watch all those <laughs> over again. I was super wanting to see it. Then I was like, well, I'm trying to save up money for Comic Con, so. Uh, and I just bought, a, and Chuck and I just hung out at the uh, comic book store uh, this past Saturday. So I had spent a lot of money there. So I didn't eventually end up doing it, but <laughs> uh, it's still there in the back of my head, going, "Buy me, <laughs> buy me." Maybe we'll get lucky and then go on Netflix. But it's the one breaking joke the did. fourth wall and <laughs> telling you to buy it. <laughs> the one joke I did was think was funny though when they were making fun of the turtles blimp. Because uh, I realized that is like the worst vehicle ever. It really <laughs> serves. No yeah, purpose. it's like this is kind of pointless. I'm like, yeah, they're they're, they're kind of right. That does really make no sense. But did you see the little animated uh, Toka and Razor? Yeah, yeah, I did. When they were jumping on the party rat wagon and yeah, yeah, it's a nice touch. Yeah, yeah, it was nice and all the different images of all the different turtles was pretty cool. So I am kind of intrigued to go back and, and like read those comics. Cause I, I, I do wonder like what that was universe was like on the comic form, like how, how it worked. Yeah. Greg and I were talking about that a little bit. I'm pretty sure it's uh, way more violent than the cartoon was. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I could, I could imagine that. And I just have two more things. I'll talk about these real quick. Cause I actually have a, a review of nonstop on the site that you can check out and a review of these Plug. two. <laughs> and a review of these two films too the first is knights of badass them and what that <laughs> i know what that is it's a <laughs> it just came out this year it's actually on video on demand and it's uh it's a larping comedy and for those that don't know what larping is it's live action role playing it's like dungeon dungeons and dragons but acting it out for real like medieval times and stuff like that and it's it's like that mixed with like an evil dead in a way because it they end up like getting real monsters that they have to feel uh, fight with and stuff like that. What are really they just ah, real monsters? No, no, more like like one monster, oh, like a, okay. like one succubus that they conjure up that they have to. That's almost treated more like a vampire until the end. It's it was okay. It was a little bit disappointing because the cast is pretty incredible. They have Summer Glau. She was in a lot of geeky shows like Sarah uh, Connor Connor Chronicles. She was in Serenity and Firefly. She's actually an arrow, too. Oh, yeah. She's an arrow, too. Yeah. She's in that. Uh, Peter Dinklage, who's in Game of Thrones, and who's going to be the villain in x Men Days of Future Past, isn't it? And he's probably my favorite character. He plays like this uh, this guy who's really into LARPing and is kind of crazy and uh, is a pretty, pretty big badass. He's like the reason it's called badass, and from what I can tell. And there's a guy from True Blood and Steve Zahn, who's not familiar with any geek shows, but he's in a lot of stuff. But it's OK. There's some funny moments. It's. I would wait for it. It'll probably be on Netflix soon in a few months. So maybe well, check Netflix it out. Well, Netflix already has a, a movie about LARPing and it Sorry. doesn't have to, it doesn't go into any like a uh, supernatural or horror realms. It's, it's more of a, a guy kind of starting up his own uh, LARPing camp and kind of coming up with the idea and, and stuff. So they, they have one on, on uh, Netflix already and it was not that good either. So, <laughs> There was Can a, we come up with a better term than LARPing? I mean, it just sounds weird. It does. It does. It sounds. It is an off a weird term. It uh, it reminds me of a billboard I saw on the highway. It, it said "Go RVing," but every time I see it, I'm like, "What's gorving?" <laughs> <laughs> There's actually a, a documentary too uh, called I think it's still on Netflix called Dark On about LARPing as well. It's actually about like this camp that doesn't not far from where I live. Anyways, 
you can see my review on the site, and I think I've been talking way too much. So I will stop talking, and I will throw it over to Greg to see what he's been up to. Not that much. Got my uh, stack down a little bit more from that uh, infamous BAM trip that I, I got a whole <laughs> bunch of stuff from. I read Avenging Spider-Man. Issues 1 through 3 are a team-up of Spider-Man and the Red Hulk, and they go off to save J. Jonah Jameson, Broomtop. From the Moloid gets sucked into the underworld. Spider-Man and the Red Hulk get delayed by a giant ass freaking worm that comes up from the ground. Don't and they always come from the ground, those giant worms? Yes, they do. Uh, <laughs> Beetlejuice, Dune. Uh, the one from Star Wars on the asteroid. <laughs> Tremor. Yes, thank you. Was it Tremors, that movie? Uh, I had never seen it. Oh, so. yeah. Tremors. From like, Kevin Bacon, you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can kind of say a movie and then throw Kevin Bacon, and you're like, yeah, he was in that. <laughs> <laughs> Morgan uh, Freeman must have been in it, too, then. <laughs> he did the narration. <laughs> they all get stuck underground, and, and essentially the, the Moloids are, are looking for help uh, from the ruler ab- of, from the uh, above world. Because the underground has been taken over by these uh, huge uh, freaking monster creatures and they kick the mo- uh, mole man's ass. And essentially, Red Hulk and uh, Spider-Man have to come in and save Jonah, save Mole Man to put him back on the, the throne of the underworld, save the Moloids and uh, all that good stuff. It, it was a fun story. Seems like it was it might have picked up where another comic has left off, but I'm not too sure because I really didn't read any comics that that led into this. But it kind of starts up at the end of a uh, Avengers mission, and I thought the art was really good. It's by uh, Joe. I'm going to slaughter this man's last name. Johnson. Uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> Joe uh, Madura. It would have been worse if it was like Smith or something. <laughs> uh, Joe Madura. I thought his art was really good. I don't think Chuck would enjoy it. I know Chuck doesn't like cartoony art. Probably and, not, then. And this kind of goes off into the little bit towards cartoony realm. But I, I always think that works with uh, Spider-Man, if you have uh, an artist that's a little bit more cartoony. Because uh, he, his, his personality can come off a little bit more cartoony. And I, I think that leads to more interesting stuff with trying to convey his fast movement and stuff like that with uh, overextended limbs kind of saying that he's going faster. It implies uh, motion better, I think, uh, than uh, something that looks a little bit more lifelike, like Alex Ross. But uh, I also I looked it up because I, I really thought the, the inking was well done, and Joe does his own inking, and I thought that was... It was inking that I've never really seen before, usually... Usually it's a lot of shadows that are just black. And I felt the shadows were a little bit lighter in this, the way he does it. And you could see kind of the line work in the shadows, which I thought was interesting and and something I haven't really seen before. And it kind of gives the, uh, the art a little bit more texture to it, I think. Then in the fourth issue, Spider-Man hooks up with, well, not literally hooks up with Hawkeye. Oh, that'd be awesome, though. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, yeah. But they kind of go off on patrol, and Hawkeye's not interested in in really patrolling with Spider-Man, but he does it anyway, reluctantly, and they find find a robbery committed by a dude in a snake outfit, and they're trying to figure out what that means and what that leads up to. It's it's kind of a, a no dub, but that kind of leads up into the next issue contained in this graphic novel, uh, where Spider Man pretty much uh, man crushes on Ca- Captain America as they try and take down the Serpent Society. Was it Bucky Cap or was it Steve Rogers Cap? It was Steve Rogers Cap. the The whole Avengers team is there for that one, but it's kind of just Cap and Spider Man kind of go off on their own little thing. Not a lot of action in this last one, but what I think they were mostly going for with these books is kind of showing, is exploring the relationships between Spider-Man and the his Avenger teammate, which I don't think they really explore that much in issues of Avengers or any of the team-up books anymore, really. I think mostly they go for those as the villains and more, what's the word, I want a harder more dense subject material instead of the relationships between the team. Like they, they give you little glimpses at it anymore or maybe like here and there, but this is, this is essentially all just dealing with 
relationships for the most parts and kind of discovering and his teammates discovering stuff about Spider-Man, Spider-Man discovering stuff about his teammates and his teammates not finding out, finding out that he's more than just a nerdy, fast talking joke machine for the most part. So that was that one. Next I read Astonishing X-Men. And this I'm really going to mess up too. Xenogenesis. Is it the name of the artist or the name of the comic? <laughs> That's the name of the comic. Okay. I, I, <laughs> I don't remember the name of the artist. Uh, but since we're on that subject, I thought the art was interesting. I'm not sure if it's really a style that I particularly care for. I thought some of the the features of people it was it was weird let's say um but unlike most uh lonely comic book artists that just draw really huge boobs he went off and focused more on the ass hip section there's still a lot of boobs going on but he they, like they were really disproportionate like hip and butt it was like barbie uh mid midsection and like a Kim Kardashian from there down after <laughs> it was, it was really weird. Um, it wasn't like Rob Leefield or somebody. Was it? <laughs> no, it was, it wasn't like he, he was screws up proportions like another Mara. Rob Leefield is just doing it because I, I don't think he's practiced enough on proportions. That's, that's not what's going on with this guy. This guy has, I think it's more of a, a style choice than uh, kind of what the tools that he has to work with. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, it, it was, it was a good story. It was essentially the, this, this is, takes place during the X-Men's time of no more mutants. So no more mutants are being born and, um, they kind of hear that mutants are being born in Africa. So they kind of go in and investigate and they're not in their usual, uh, field outfit teams. They're more, um, trying to stay casual. So it's, it's like, uh, cargo shorts and caps and, uh, uniforms. I don't even think they were like t-shirts, but they're, they have tops that all match and everything. All their clothes are matching except for Emma Frost, who's, kind of being a bitch <laughs> that'll that'll keep him very casual let's all dress alike no one will notice yeah, us. yeah. <laughs> so it's like an old navy commercial <laughs> <laughs> kind of yeah actually yeah now that you say it <laughs> but it, it was interesting one of my favorite lines from it was when a uh, mother was giving birth to her child and the father was there i think it was kind of slightly racist too or or uh and, and kind of was like ragging on African people. It makes probably makes me a bad person, but I thought the line was funny. The guy says to the the wife's ragging on him because like, how could you do this to me? How could you put this uh, demon seed in in me? And the guy goes, "I didn't know the condom would split. My father had used it for twenty years without a problem." <laughs> oh, 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 yeah. Oh, it was, <laughs> oh man, I feel just, dirty. Yeah, it, but the line just stuck out to me, and it, I felt bad for laughing, but I, I definitely laughed at that. Um, <laughs> Sounds like more than the artist was out of proportion here. <laughs> yeah, um, but it, it was an interesting story, and uh, the author of this one was uh, Warren Ellis, and I thought he had a, a great feel for the characters that I don't think <laughs> Brian Michael Bendis really has. <laughs> I, and I thought the the personalities were a little bit more outstanding than than I have really seen lately. Like Wolverine's there chugging down beers and everything, uh, but he's still being really intelligent, and he's just kind of part of the team. He's he's not the leader, which I, I'd rather not see Wolverine in the leader role. I'd rather see him a little bit calmer and relaxed, kind of hanging out drinking his beer. Emma Frost was kind of bitchy. Cyclops has got a stick in his ass like the prototypical characters he's kind of going with in this as opposed to uh, other uh, authors that are kind of going off on different tangents at this point. That's that one. Um, I also watched um, a movie on Netflix. I'm not sure if you guys ha have heard about this one. It's kind of back from our child, uh, our childhood. Uh, it's called Bushwhacked. I have not. OK, no, never, never saw that. You guys have seen uh, Home Alone, correct? That I have. Yes. Oh, you know what? I think I do. Is this with the guy from Home Alone? Yes, it's uh, got Daniel Stern, uh, one of the sticky or wet bandits. Yes, it's like. Oh a wait a minute! I think I did see this. Is he the Boy Scout troop leader or whatever? 
Yeah, he's he's gotten accused of murder, and uh, so it's a child story. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah I'm he, I'm sorry, I have seen this. Yeah, yeah. I I figured you guys would. It kind of stuck with which I wanted to talk about in a little bit, but I guess we could talk about it now. I don't think we really see many of these movies anymore, where it's kind of like kid centric. It's centered around kids, like everyday kids. It's not like movies anymore where it's like Harry Potter, where it's got kids. The kids are so heroic and so in science fiction realm. This is more realistic. It kind of fall in, uh, falls in the line of like, what's the one with all the, the kids and they're at a fat camp? Heavyweights? Got yeah, it, it's more in the line of heavyweights and um, like Sandlot. Good and choice. I don't think we really see any of those type of movies anymore only one i can think of are those like diary of wimpy kid movies that are based upon that those kid novels that are kid centric for the most part from what i can tell but i don't know if we just don't see them because they're not advertised to us but for the or, most part uh, we outgrew them or yeah it seems like all the movies now are, are all like teen movies like twilight or hunger games or divergent that there aren't many movies like directed towards kids that are about yeah, kids. There's there's a lot more movies that are are more mature anymore, and I don't think and if you're getting a kids movie, it's going to be a CGI movie like Frozen or something like that. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm thinking of stuff like uh, like you're saying we don't have anything like uh, Little Rascals or Goonies or uh, I can't think of the other one, but just stuff like that where it's like average yeah. kids like just yeah, hanging like out. A- yeah, and then they maybe have to like overcome something that's that's more into the adult realm, not something so far that goes into the realm of science fiction. Like Honey, yeah. I Shrunk the Kids or something like that. Which yeah, are, exactly. Like, like a family comedy that you know that are the kids are more the hero. Yeah, we don't we don't you don't see as much. Like a, yeah, I, I find that kind of disappointing. Yeah, to be quite honest. I wanted to say one of my favorite things that I I completely forgot about. And it's it's part of a movie where the all the boys kind of have to go to the bathroom and they're peeing off of a ledge. And uh, Daniel Stern is kind of like walking around behind them creepily as they're peeing. And he goes, shake your lizards, let them drain, move your hips. And they all shout, spell your name. <laughs> Send it straight. <laughs> Send it hard. Now a sword fight. Go. On guard! <laughs> eat, your, eat your veggies. Eat your starches. Lean back, boys. Golden arches. <laughs> All right, now... following along, too, while he was listening. <laughs> All right, now flip them up and zip them, and let's go. <laughs> I just got a giant kick out of that as I was laying in bed watching it it made me feel really good deep down inside. You were in the bathroom peeing with it. <laughs> yes, I'm, I am I now repeat that to myself as I'm taking a leak anymore. <laughs> the Golden Arches pun makes you think of McDonald's in an entire different light. That That's exactly what I thought of as soon as they said going to Golden Arches. Very nice, Greg. Very nice. Have you? Is that it for you? Uh, yeah, I think I've talked enough. <laughs> All right, Chuck, your moment of truth. What have you been up to? Well, I haven't been up to too much... Uh, this week, but I did want to mention a cool thing from last night. I was on Facebook, and big shocker here, I like the Arrow page on Facebook. <laughs> anyway, last night they they had uh, a picture of Stephen Amell, who plays Arrow, and he had this sticky note to his head that said uh, he's going to be in a live chat at 7 o'clock. So I'm seeing it at about 7.30. I figure, well, I'll jump in, you know, and uh, I was looking through, and he was answering people's questions, and I typed in a couple of questions. Unfortunately, he didn't get to answer them, but I still thought it was pretty cool. And uh, it's pretty neat that he takes uh, some time out to do that for his fans and stuff. I guess he answered about like 200 questions or something like that. Unfortunately, there was about 8,000 questions submitted, but he does that from time to time. So if you're a fan of the show, keep keep an eye out for that on Facebook. It's it's pretty cool. He's, he's a cool guy. Chuck, if you're interested in more stuff like that on uh Reddit, they have a, a section called Ask Me Anything, and occasionally they'll get um, famous people. Uh, they've had uh, 
now that I'm trying to think of it, nothing's coming to mind. Um, <laughs> I think Samuel L. Jackson. Out of I mean, pretty much like Samuel L. Jackson's done it. Like uh, I think even Stan, did Stan Lee do one? I forget, but I don't remember. But but it's the various people, um, people yeah. there that that'll come in, and they usually have on the the side of the page like a, a like a little calendar of who will be on and what time and when. So. There, there's some pretty neat stuff, pretty neat people coming on there. If you ever were interested in talking to more people, celebrities and interesting yeah, people, that's pretty cool. It was funny too because somebody, I'm thinking, well, he's gonna pick out you know the best questions, and someone asked, "How are you?" and he replied to it. He's like, "I'm well, thank you." <laughs> yeah, it's probably like, okay, I, I could knock this one out in about two seconds and get to somebody else and kind of hit everybody. So. Yeah, I'm not I'm, leaving too many people out. I'm sure I know he left a lot about. Cause last time I looked at the page, it said like 8,000 comments or something. And yeah. I know he, he honestly probably didn't even see my questions, unfortunately. But did you tell him uh, that that he sponsors your show, your <laughs> podcast? <laughs> I was going to I was going to say, like, hey, you want to be on a podcast? Because sure you've <laughs> never been asked that before. <laughs> did you tell him he still owes you money for the last 50 billion advertisements? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. Out of out of the like eight thousand comments, I'm pretty sure a good fifty five thousand of them were we will be on my podcast. So. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but yeah, other than that, I I did get to see one movie this weekend. I was able to uh, catch a disaster movie that I found on TV Sunday morning, a uh, little sci fi disaster movie, and that was called The Core, starring Aaron Eckhart and Hilary Swank. They do a lot of ab exercises. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Eight minute abs. <laughs> but, um, I I do enjoy some disaster movies now and then, and I kind of started watching a couple minutes of this one. I thought the premise of this one was interesting enough, so I decided to keep watching. In this, basically, the they say that the outer core of the Earth seems to have stopped spinning around the inner core. Okay, thank you. I was and, gonna say outer core. What the fuck? That's an oxymoron. <laughs> but then you yeah. said okay. So and that's like apparently is a really bad thing and all this bad stuff's going to happen to us wonderful folk here on the surface. I'm going to stick my disclaimer in here. I'm sorry if, if you've seen this movie and you didn't like it and you have to relive it now by listening to my summary, but you know, maybe liked it there. I know there's some people that, that do kind of like this movie. I'm going to take more of the angle of like, it was, it was very amusing, kept my attention, but I'm going to kind of take the angle of like making fun of the science in the movie. Like, <laughs> it's <laughs> I think it's hilarious. They explain that the Earth's protective electromagnetic field is being generated by the spinning action. I don't know if you guys remember or have heard anything from physics at all about like when a large mass of metal is like spinning around another piece of metal, it kind of generates this EM field. And one of, this is actually one of the few like scientific principles that they actually get correct in this movie. But Mark one for the movie, zero for actual science. <laughs> <laughs> so because of the core stops spinning, all this weird stuff starts happening on the surface and they explain how there's gonna be more electrical discharge from these super storms and stuff, like just basically a crap load of lightning strikes will start happening. And then also because the EM field is down, all these dangerous microwaves and cosmic ma- radiation are going to start reaching uh, the surface of the Earth and all this stuff. We will and, have a surplus of popcorn, though. Yeah. <laughs> all of it. <laughs> Popped <laughs> at once. But, uh, they do this funny thing, too, where like he puts a peach on a fork or something, and they blowtorch it, and they're like, yeah, this will be the Earth when uh, you know the microwaves hit us. <laughs> <laughs> it's just kind of funny. Like In the one scene in the beginning of the movie, that I guess like they're kind of going for... Uh, how birds kind of use a little bit of the electromagnetic field to kind of navigate like where they're flying and stuff, but they took it to the extreme. And the, in this scene, they have like this huge flock of birds in uh, Trafalgar Square in London, and they just have all these birds just start flying straight into stuff all of a sudden. <laughs> like they're hitting people, they're running into buildings, crashing through windows, and apparently London has the shittiest glass on Earth. <laughs> because the birds just like they fly into this glass and they crash through it like really easily. And the funny thing is too, like the sounds of that these birds are making is absolutely horrible. I guess it's supposed to be 
like pigeons or something, but <laughs> it's like this high pitched squeaking noise that sounds nothing like pigeons to me. <laughs> so it's it's kind of like birdemic almost. <laughs> exactly. I was just gonna say it reminded me to the T like of birdemic, just this really cheesy like sound editing, like it was hilarious. I tell you what, though, Chuck, the Birdemic is essentially based off of Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds, and I'm assuming they're taking that scene also from Alfred Hitchcock. It pro- Yeah, it but, seemed like very esque, you know. Yeah, I may be breaking people's hearts and I may get a lot of shit for this, but I thought Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds, I thought that was really cheesy as well. So, like, Birdemic kind of just kind of takes it into the digital age with computer generated. So I'm assuming this movie is kind of like the birds from back in the day where it's like a lot of stuff mannequin, like really, you could really tell it's not a living bird type of stuff. These actually looked really good. Like I have to say they, it actually looked real, but the sound was terrible. Like, (laughs) I don't know how they did the sound for these, but it just sounded like they were like stepping on mice or something. I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> but anyway so all these scientists like meet up and they come up with this plan and this whole thing is extremely reminiscent of the armageddon movie so like all these scientists meet up and they want to build this ship to travel down through the earth and into the core they have and... animal crackers dancing across bellies <laughs> yeah really <laughs> And <laughs> Did you imagine scientists doing that? They're all laying out with their bellies out. <laughs> and little crackers flying to belly buttons. Aerosmith starts playing. And stuff. <laughs> Do you think someone out in the world is doing what we're doing right now exactly at the same time? It's, yeah. <laughs> I, hope I hope so. so. Oh, man. That is one of the worst movies or moments in movie history. <laughs> yeah. I, and I do I love that movie, but that's that's a pretty bad one. Batman. Batfleck. <laughs> <laughs> <Animal crackers. laughs> Bat <laughs> but anyway, they they want to build this ship, and their goal is to like get to the core of the Earth and restart its spinning action by wait for it, setting off a bunch of nuclear bombs. <laughs> you mean they're not oh. just going to fly around it backwards? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a- apparently, every disaster can be fixed by setting off a nuke. The funny the funny part is too they only take five nukes with them, which we'll visit that later on, but. The one funny part, like towards the beginning, too, there's a a panel of scientists and they're sitting around waiting for a meeting to start again, like Armageddon. (laughs) And the one lead scientist kind of explains how the detonation of the nukes will restart the core and like get it spinning again. So he's talking and he's like, well, you know, we drill down to the mantle core interface and and we set off the bombs. And if my calculations are correct, the core should restart. And I'm like, wait a second. You just say if your calculations are correct. <laughs> that, that's kind of a big if. I mean, your whole plan is kind of resting on that being correct. <laughs> you don't tell people if my calculations are correct. <laughs> it was just this really fun part. So I'm like, I got past it. I'm like, whatever. Let's see where this goes. So they find this guy who is the guy from Gone in 60 Seconds that plays the cop that's always chasing Nicolas Cage. This guy pl- plays this like really uh reserved scientist that lives out in the middle of nowhere and he invented this fancy laser that cuts through rock like no tomorrow because there is no tomorrow <laughs> and <laughs> day after tomorrow there is none <laughs> yeah really. and they designed this ship to withstand all the pressure that is found deep in the earth cuz that's possible under pressure dun, 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 dun. <laughs> that there's our first song change. <laughs> yeah, I had to get it in somewhere, and that was that was a perfect one for me. And so they have this like reverse space shuttle launch where the thing is like dropped down instead of going up. And I'm telling you, this thing is like Armageddon's annoying little brother or something. <laughs> <laughs> so they enter the crust at the deepest spot on Earth, which is the Marianas Trench, because you know you're traveling 2,900 miles down, so. By getting two miles closer, you know, that's really hard. <laughs> that's why all airports are on top of mountains. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So, of course, on the way down, they kind of run into some hardship and stuff starts happening. They fall through this empty space underground, which, uh, according to what I've read, like, it isn't possible at those kind of pressures and everything. But it makes for makes for a good movie. They find this this really weird, creepy place with all these crystals and stuff. And, uh, they get, they get going through the one part and there's this, there's these humongous floating diamonds. And, uh, 
kind of one hits the ship and you know they start losing a couple of crew members here and there and then they realize after they're finally all the way down to the core that the five nukes that they brought with them won't be enough force to restart the core it's kind of like getting to the science fair and realizing you forgot your project (laughs) or your glasses yeah and there's where that if comes in i guess his calcs were not correct (laughs) So, and like, you know, big surprise, only throwing five nukes at the core of the earth is like blowing a straw wrapper at Juggernaut. (laughs) (laughs) But anyway, they say, uh, you know, well, if we detonate one at a time, they'll amplify each other's shockwaves and that'll do the trick. So, of course, it works and somebody else dies and there's two people left and they need to get back home. And the laser on the ship is broken now, of course. So how are they going to get back? Well. They just fly back through the mantle and the crust, dodging all the dangerous things that they ran into on the way down. (laughs) Somehow they mysteriously miss them all and they come up through a crack in the Earth's crust near Hawaii. And uh, I just figured, well, you know, I I guess the ride home is always quicker anyway. (laughs) (laughs) Three quarters of the movie to get there, about a quarter to get back. Exactly. (laughs) But um, I am kind of poking fun at it quite a bit, but. It actually was pretty entertaining. I mean, I I had a good time watching it and it kind of pulls you in a little bit. And it is interesting to kind of think about, you know, what's happening and stuff like that, even if it is a bit laughable at parts. But it is entertaining. You need to watch more B-rated movies with me, Chuck. I know. I got to say, it's a lot of fun making fun of the song. (laughs) It is. (laughs) The funny thing about this film, too, is that there's actually a geology class at the University of British Columbia where they show this movie to the students and it's used to analyze all the science mistakes in it. (laughs) (laughs) And the ironic part is during the filming, which was done in Vancouver, one of the professors from that same school was consulted about the scientific (laughs) references in the film. (laughs) Fail. (laughs) I think he now teaches where Dan and I went to high school. (laughs) You probably watched this on a loop, too. Yeah. yeah. See, that's wrong. That's wrong. I don't know. I mean, I think it's worth a watch if you really get into disaster movies. Like, you might like it, especially if you like something like 2012 or Day After Tomorrow, stuff like that. It's kind of like stuff that you don't mind. Like, that's kind of far-fetched and they don't really explain too well. I honestly think it would make a great episode for How Did This Get Made? Uh, the podcast. I don't know if they've ever done that one, but I think that would be pretty funny to hear. They have a, a long list of movies to get through, I think. Yeah. Maybe we could do one even. I don't know. Anyway. I just did. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, you're right. I think we did. <laughs> so that brings me to a question for you guys. What are each of your favorite disaster films? And I'm talking all time. Doesn't matter what it may be. Greg, why don't you go first? Uh, well, one of my favorite is... The original, not not the one. Who the fuck was it? Uh, Kurt Russell, I think, was in it. Uh, Keanu but, Reeves. But, no, not Keanu Reeves. Um, is uh, Poseidon Adventure? Oh yeah. I watched it when I was really, really little. Well, I don't know how old I was, but it, I was on the younger side, and it's one of the very few movies that I can remember from when I was younger, and I just remember me like grabbing on to the couch cushion the entire time it was just very suspenseful and i thought it was uh very well done it had some great actors in there too um it had and i'm not going to come up with any of their names right now you're talking about the one with uh ernest borgnine <laughs> yes ernest borgnine uh lex luther was in there uh, yes gene hackman gene hackman was in there uh there are probably a couple others but i'm i'm not remembering who was in there uh but had some great scenes in there. Uh, just scary shit. They're in the. Uh, it, it probably it takes up a lot of my uh, my least favorite things. I, I'm very claustrophobic, and they get in very tight spaces. I'm not a huge fan of heights. I, I could. I'm all right, but uh, they they climb huge, huge heights, and um, I'm not the greatest underwater either. There's. I, I'm just sounding like uh, what's his name from freaking Rugrats. Chucky. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm sounding like Chucky from Rugrats. Uh, and there was a scene where a lady goes into the water and she has to hold her breath for like freaking three minutes or something. 
Uh, oh yeah, that's scary. The other side, like, and it's very claustrophobic down there too. Like everything in this movie is just like stuff I am scared of. The only thing they're they're missing is like snakes. But to be in this <laughs> t- this ship that's rolled over and just sinking and just being stuck in there, that, that the whole thing is just a giant. This is what I fear movie. It just gets to me every time, and I haven't seen it in a while, yeah, I, and I, I really have to see it again. I have seen that one. That's that's very good. What You didn't think uh, too highly of the newer one with Kurt Russell, then? I just didn't see it, because I loved the old one so much that I, I didn't want to ruin it. The new one's very similar. Probably, like, if you like the old one that much, you're probably not going to like it, just because that's the way that usually works. But it, it is very similar. It's It's kind of well done, but... Yeah, but it, it, this movie scares me shitless, people. Like horror <laughs> movies, I can, I can sit through fine. This one has like a whole bunch of shit that I'm actually scared of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Dan, what do you think? What's what's your favorite disaster film? <clears throat> my fa- well, I actually have a bunch, but probably my all time favorite is uh, the Paul Newman, Steve McQueen classic, The Towering Inferno. I don't know if you guys okay. have seen that. It's It was one of the first, I think, really big, dis- I guess maybe not the first disaster movie, but it was came in that time of the 70s or 60s. I, I'm not sure off the top of my head uh, where like I think disaster movies were really hitting it big. You had stuff like Earthquake and stuff like that. But it's just really notable because Steve McQueen and Paul Newman were both in it. And it holds up really well with some of the action set pieces. There's a really great moment of like Paul Newman like climbing up broken stairs, which looks like he's doing it just by himself. Like he, like he's really doing it with, without a stuntman. Um, that, that is pretty impressive. So I really like that. I, I guess you consider these disaster films, if you call like alien invasion disaster movies, but the original, the day the earth stood still. I love that one too, Dan. Yeah. I, I knew you one didn't. of my least favorite people is in there, but I, that is one of my most favorite, uh, old time science fiction films. Yeah, and when you said like uh, we were talking about a remake, I thought you were thinking of the remake of the Day of the Earth. So that's why I said Keanu Reeves. Yeah, I, I figure that's what you're going with, and in my head, I was going, "Oh, Dan, that that very cl- very close. They're they're both up there." But I I was thinking, uh, but I didn't really think of that one as a, a disaster film for the most part. Yeah, I guess more so like War of the Worlds would be more disaster. The, yeah, the but, old yeah. or the or, or the remake, which I, I really even enjoy the the remake by still Steven Spielberg. I think that's still pretty good. Yeah, Apollo thirteen, I guess. Not oh yeah, the Andromeda Strain, which is another like seventies film about. I've seen that one. I think that's the one where they keep they have a, a secret headquarters underneath like this farmhouse. Yeah, there's like a virus they're trying to. Yeah, that one's that one's really interesting. It's really interesting because it's very procedural. It's it's not. It almost feels very realistic, along with this uh, almost like a, not, not an updated version of it, but Contagion that came out a few years ago. Yeah, it's, it's like you're going through the a weird CDC. Yeah, yeah. Contagion felt like a really realistic look at what would happen if we had like an outbreak of some sort. So, uh, and I, some other ones that came to my mind were uh, Gravity that just came out. Like that to me is pretty phenomenal. Also, The Gray. I really, really liked The Gray. That to me was a movie that really surprised me. And this movie came out last year. It's called It's a Disaster. It's more of a comedy, and it's more about, like, people that are in a house having dinner, and suddenly, like, the world is ending around them, and how that kind of takes place. So it's not necessarily a disaster film per se, but it's a, a different take on it. So, of course, yeah. I didn't just have one because I'm, 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 <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a movie buff. Or I'm just, you know, a hoarder when it comes to stuff like this. <laughs> so I can't just pick one. I have to collect them all, like some sort of... Pokemon. Pokemon. Um, anyways, Chuck, what about you? Or what are your favorites? I know that I also have a lot like you. It's it's kind of not super hard to pick because there's two that I really love, but they're actually neck and neck. I will mention f- firstly that probably one of my favorite old time sci fi disaster movies is the classic uh, The Blob. Oh, that's good. Yeah, that. I mean, if you look at it in today's light, like yeah, it's really cheesy and everything, but. I think for back then it was, you know, pretty scary. And, um, uh, I also has Steve McQueen in his very first role. Right. Yeah. And, you know, people didn't know how to stop this thing. And then they finally discovered it had kind of a weakness for cold and stuff like that. So, um, always enjoyed that one. That was, I think a favorite of my mom's too. She was always a big fan of that film. And, uh, but actually my two favorites that 
I really have a hard time picking one over the other. They're kind of neck and neck. Those are Armageddon and Twister. Ooh, good choice. Yeah. The, the, I, uh, the popular uh, game where you have the colored pad with the dots on it? <laughs> that can be a disaster, <laughs> no, depending on how you yeah, play. If I play, that is a disaster. <laughs> I do love Armageddon because uh, there's so many great actors in that movie, I think, and they kind of mesh surprisingly well, I think. And there's there's just like a an epicness to it. Like, I don't know, like the soundtrack, like there's a lot of good songs in there. There's a lot of funny moments in it, you know, like Michael Clark Duncan playing Papa Bear, you know, when they're kind of chasing <laughs> him down on the motorcycle. He's like, come get Papa Bear. <laughs> Even and, uh, on a jet plane. <laughs> I can't get that freaking deep. Yeah. Though. And then the, the other part with uh, with your guy, Greg, uh, I can't think of his name right now. An Affleck. Um, but, no, the guy, he was sitting on the nuclear bomb, and he's like, oh, I just wanted to feel the power between my legs. Steve Buscemi. Yeah, yeah oh, Steve Buscemi's awesome. I know, he's hilarious in that. A lot of funny move, moments in that movie. Like, it's it's a movie about, like, the end of the world, but they still managed to make it really light and funny. And I'm, I was always impressed on how they made that work. You still feel that sense of urgency and, like, that kind of that panic. But there's all those light moments that just, like... It's it's just perfect timing, I think. And then Twister, I guess maybe it's because I kind of experienced a tornado when I was younger. When I was in like seventh grade, we had one come like really close to our house and probably like the scariest moment of my life. And you'd think I would be afraid of that from then on. But I think the for some reason, this movie just like connected. I just connected with it. And uh, the really cool thing at the end of this movie, at the end of Twister, they play what I consider the greatest piece of instrumental music ever written, which is respect the wind done by Van Halen. That is such a cool song. I don't know if you guys know what I'm talking about, but it's kind of when the credits are rolling, just that ridiculous, like electric guitar that they're playing. It's so cool. I could just listen to that. I could just listen to that for like hours, but yeah, that that's a favorite of mine. Every, anytime it's on TV, I have to watch it. So those are pretty much my, uh, my choices. Twister was also the very first DVD ever made, so some random bit of trivia. But Yeah, and I think I have it. I think I have the first one ever released. <laughs> <laughs> very nice. It's like that first copy ever. I think that'll end it for the segment. We'll be, when we're coming back, we'll be discussing, you know, what's in a name? Apparently a lot, and we'll be talking about that in just a bit. We'll see you. Fifty years ago, a little old man brought his little blue box to a junkyard. And now, Doctor Who is a cultural phenomena worldwide. Join the GeekCast Radio Network and Mark Who 42's Hooniverse as we review Doctor Who episodes past and present, discuss the Doctor's friends and enemies, see where the Doctor's been, where he is, and where he's going. Sit back and grab a jelly baby and join Mark Who 42's Hooniverse. It's the ride of this and every other lifetime. Fantastic. Allons-y. All right, and welcome back. And for today, we have another brand new game. That's what we love doing here at Talking in Circles is breaking new ground. And for today, the Game Master is actually Greg. He's the one that came up with the idea, so he'll be the one taking us through it. So, Greg, why don't you give us a rundown of what the power of names is really all about? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw out a name to either Chuck or Dan. And this name can be an actual name that has been used in uh, comic book lore. It could be something like, uh, let's say, Spider-Man. And then they'll Chuck will be like, hmm, let me see. I'm really smart. That one's an actual name. So true. And I'll be like, <laughs> OK, so what, what are Spider-Man's powers? Chuck being a smart kooky is going to be like, well, of course, he's got the proportional strength of a spider can climb up walls, shoot out, uh, well, he invented web shooters that he could shoot out his webbing with, and he's got a spider sense. And I'll go, oh, very, you are very smart, Chuck. That's all correct. Chuck, and, good job. Chuck. How's Chuck winning already? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Tell him what he's won. <laughs> and and then there could be a name like Suspender Man. And Dan's going to be like, well, I'm also smart, so I'm gonna, I know that name's bunch of crap coming from greg's twisted messed up mind so i'm gonna say <laughs> false and i'm gonna be like, very good dan you got that part right and then he's gonna come up with, uh, even though it is false he could come he's gonna come up with a, a name 
or a list of powers that this suspender man can have. And uh, we'll leave that one up, open up to, to both of them. So uh, Dan could have a shot at it. And then Chuck can have a shot at it. They both could come up with something. And the winner of that will be whoever I like the most. You fans have nothing to do with it. <laughs> Sorry, but you have nothing to do with it. You can leave it in the comments if you like, or if you have different thoughts of a uh, set of powers for the, the characters that we throw out there. But like, uh, whose line is it anyway? The the points aren't really going to matter that much in this game. Because I was Justin Bieber's career. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> The, the points aren't going to matter because I, I got really lazy and I couldn't figure out how to award points. So <laughs> <laughs> it, it was just too much for my tiny little brain. You both have already gotten two questions right before the game has even started. But I, I guess we'll start it off with we did a coin toss before we started, which we actually didn't do. And I'm just picking Chuck to go first because I've got a man crush on him tonight. Crap. for some reason. You too? Oh, <laughs> So let's throw out the first name. Uh, let me pick out a good one for you, Chuck. I'm going to mess this up. Okay, th- then we'll start with an easy one. How about that? Sounds would good. You like, would you like an easy one? Sure. The Smiler. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, excuse me. Oh, boy. I- I'm going to say that that's a, that's a fake character. You are correct, sir. What is what is your your guess for the the powers of the Smiler? Or what I like more is the powers. Oh boy, I'm gonna say it's kind of like a like a cheap um, Image Comics knockoff of the Joker or something. It's uh, somebody that you know has uh, some type of laughing gas and leaves all their victims with a gigantic smile on their face. How about that? Maybe. Okay. How about you, Dan? What do you think the Smiler is? I think the Smiler is a villain, an arch villain. I think the Smiler has, after repeatedly smacks to the face, has gained an awfully looking grin on their face. And because of this, they have vowed that they will take down anyone who is actually not smiling. Yeah, that doesn't work <laughs> at all. So, and, <laughs> Chuck, you win. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dan, I don't I don't even need to, to cast my vote. Dan has already submitted to Chuck's will. Well, Dan's got some backstory there. I don't know. It sounded good. <laughs> uh, well, we'll give it. We'll give it to Dan then. And and, and Dan, here's here's your first uh, uh, name. Let's start you off with Lobster Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> Lobster cross. Uh, wow, Lobster Johnson. Poof. I kind of hope it's real because I. I'm afraid where my mind's going to go if it's fake. <laughs> so I'm going to go, that's true? That is correct. <laughs> and I guess, do I guess their powers? You can guess their powers. I'll even give, uh, if, if you get it wrong, I'll, I'll give uh, Chuck a try at it. I'm going to guess it's an Atlantean. I'm going to guess it's some sort of mutation that because of pollution and f- swam t- too close to a lobster, so now has lobster powers which means that if you put butter on him, he tastes delicious. <laughs> Although amusing, Dan, that is incorrect. Uh, Chuck, would you like to take a shot at it? Uh, yeah, sure, I guess. I know what I want to say, but I'm not going to say it. <laughs> <laughs> Please say it. <laughs> is, is it a man who had relations with a lobster? <laughs> <laughs> and now it's stuck? Uh, I, I'm going to say it's this. it's a guy who was raised on the East coast and he was a lobster fisherman and he tragically lost his hand in a lobster accident. And he got this huge like claw on him and his last name was Johnson. So everyone calls him lobster Johnson. Now do you enjoy that, that, uh, that set of powers and everything, Chuck, but that, that is also incorrect. I do, I do <laughs> enjoy that, that, uh, backstory. Dang it. Immensely. Um, <laughs> He, he is actually a part of Mike Mignola's uh, Hellboy universe. Uh, he kind of starts off in the, in the background, and eventually he kind of got his own comic. But I took this off Dark Horse's website, I believe. It's been a while since I collected this information. If, if it's wrong, let me know in the, the comments below. I don't know everything in the world. But I have down that he has agility, astral projection, 
This is this next one's my favorite. Attractive male. <laughs> That's a power. <laughs> Apparently, we've all. Guess what, guys? We've all got powers. We're all attractive <laughs> males. Sweet. Um, got gadgets, intellect, marksmanship, phasing slash slash ghost, whatever that is. I apparently get pass through walls. Possession. Oh, possession. Yeah, yeah. Possession. I, how is I that have a- possessions too? Is <laughs> <laughs> that a power? Is this is a guy who collected a lot of lobsters. <laughs> <It's> like- <laughs> He's got uh, stamina, stealth, unarmed combat skills, and he's a weapons master. Unarmed have- because he has a lobster claw. <laughs> <laughs> that is his weapon. He is unarmed. He's clawed. I- I've never really gotten into the the lobster Johnson part of uh, Hellboy comics. I do read Hellboy, but I've never gotten into the lobster Johnson uh, uh, lore. But uh, now I think we're back to Chuck at this point. Let's see here. Uh, Let me just add real quick that that sounded like it was an Austin Powers character, too. (laughs) (laughs) I should have threw that in there. (laughs) Let's see. How about Joystick? I think that's a real character, actually. And that is correct. Nice. I have no idea what their powers are. (laughs) I'm Um, going to guess it's like some it's some character from the 80s when the arcade was really big. And yeah. like some sort of electrical storm happened while they're playing, you know, the latest edition of Pac-Man. <laughs> and now they have some sort of video game powers. OK, Chuck, did you did you think of anything in the meantime here? Or you just want to go with the same thing as Dan? That's actually pretty much what I was thinking. But I realized that there's a character called Arcade. So I I don't know if I was confusing it with that. But oh, yeah, there you I go. got nothing. He's he, he is Arcade's son. <laughs> uh, I, I i believe it is a, a woman character joystick possesses super superhuman strength agility and speed she can become a being of pure action at which at will which further enhances her speed agility and reflexes she carries batons that she can charge with energy that is released on impact or is energy blast generated by striking the batons together and she is actually a, a recent uh character invented for uh, the latest the more recent run of spider-man after that whole whole bunch of crap where they brought aunt may back to life and peter parker is no longer married to mary jane that kind of bullshit uh, so that's she's, right, she's reading yeah i haven't i haven't read any of that stuff either but they, they brought joystick recently into existence for that run of spider-man all right, I guess we're back over to Dan then. Character you're going to be guessing at is named Ashtray. <laughs> wow. <laughs> ashtray. Oof. Ashtray, ashtray. Is it Ashtray or Ashtray? <laughs> Ash. A S H. Okay, need all the information there, so I'm just making sure. Ashtray. Or, or, or it could be spelled A S H, as some people say in this area. <laughs> Which Ash- drives me up a freaking wall. Ashtray. I just it sounds like an insult or like some sort of woman that has that really deep smoking voice. So people just call her Ashtray. Yeah. <laughs> like Dr. <Doctor> Girlfriend. <laughs> exactly. I, I want to say false. I'm saying that's not a real character. And you would be correct. Oh, wow. OK. So I got to think of what Ashtray's power would be. Yeah, you have to think of get your own uh, creative juices flowing to guess what uh, you would uh, do for a character named Ashtray. By the way, we're going to do a bunch of these games, and then we're just going to write a comic about a combination of these <laughs> characters they came up with. What was, it, what was the other one? Uh, <laughs> Smiler versus Ashtray. <laughs> <laughs> they sound like a pair. He stains my teeth, that <laughs> bastard. I'm going to say Ashtray is one of those characters from those... Like bad kid comic books that teaches kids not to smoke. And it's this evil character that blows smoke and ashes in the people's faces anytime they get to the cigarettes and they cause lung cancer. <laughs> <laughs> that is not something to laugh <laughs> It's dressed up like the Marlboro Man, but also has the camel's be- uh, hump as well. I don't know. <laughs> and you just like can't, it. once you start getting around Ashtray, you just can't get away because, you know, cigarettes are addictive. <laughs> Chuck, would you like a try at this, sir? Sure. Ashtray is a hero who was involved in a 
freak accident of nature when they were smoking outside of a Denny's (laughs) (laughs) near one of those giant ashtray things. The lightning strike happened at the exact moment that they were putting their cigarette into the ashtray, thus imbuing them with the powers of an ashtray to absorb any sort of laser or sonic blast so that it has no effect on them. I thought you were going to tell a story about when we were at Denny's and the kids were out smoking and the ashtray got on fire (laughs) outside and they all, they all looked at us and it, and they're like, it's, it's on fire. And I, I just simply non plus just was like, it's raining out, put it in the rain. The rain will put the fire out. (laughs) <laughs> oh yeah that's a good idea <laughs> well everyone at denny's is drunk anyway so they can't think of anything like that and now i regret saying that i would choose them because i feel really bad choosing between those two i, I would go with chuck I, I i personally think his was better on mine on that end so <laughs> uh okay we'll, we'll put it down for chuck because even though the points don't matter i'm still marking them down for some reason <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so who 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 are we up to now? I think we're, we're on at... Chuck now. Uh, let's see. Let's try the goon. The goon. That is a real character. You are correct, sir. He is a uh, defensive lineman for the uh, Philadelphia Flyers hockey team. They put him out there to fight the uh, goons on the other team. Yes. <laughs> that was really bad. The, the, that that actually is uh, the goon from uh, the movie. Uh, I was going for comic book characters, but that that does. Uh, I, I'm going to count that anyway. Um, but I, I, I made I, up I, that I look, whole thing. I, that was terrible too. There is actually it's played by the dude from uh, Sean Williams. America. Yeah, yeah it's like this asshole guy who plays hockey, and he is just there to kick other uh, other hockey players' asses on the other team. Yeah, like, well, that's, I mean, that's my guess for this one. The, this guy has no, uh, he has no side story. He has no ulterior motives. He just goes out to, like, kick people's asses, and that's all he wants to do. Okay, I, I'm going to count it, because it is an actual, uh, that is an actual description of a, of a character. Um, so <laughs> I'm going I'm to count that. Dan, would you like to also just try and score a point by uh, guessing what the comic book, actual comic book character does uh geez well i'm gonna guess i know another real character that was also called the goon and i don't know if you guys remember this but it was a wwf character called the goon who like whose boots were like made like ice skates and he came out on like ice pads and everything like that it was really really awful uh, but <laughs> <laughs> i don't even remember that it was one of the worst gimmicks of all time <laughs> But the actual goon, I'm thinking he's some sort of member of the mob or something like that, that that he's just like a hitman that kind of takes people out and stuff. I'm marking you down as uh, correct just for the the wrestling uh, information. But uh, the goon is actually I I haven't really read it. I I, uh, my next door neighbor was recently got into it. I didn't really read it too much, but he's got agility, berserker strength. Uh, escape artist, gadgets, markmanship, stamina, super strength, unarmed combat, and he's also a weapons master. So I'm, I'm assuming this guy is also in the the Dark Horse uh, comics. <laughs> They're all the markmanship. It's like... <laughs> yeah, and stamina. He's essentially uh, this big bruiser type of character that that kind of fights supernatural beings, I believe, uh, that from my limited knowledge of, of the character. If you'd like to educate us, once again, comments below. On um, the Geek and Sundry website, they have like little cartoons of uh, the goon. They have like a little uh, animated comic that was really good. So I, I'd check that out if you, uh, you want to learn more about the character, the goon, and not want to buy a comic book straight off. So who we at at this point? I think we were to Dan. Yep. Would I be correct? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's go with Airwave. Airwave. Wow. Jeez. Airwave. Hmm. I want to go with real. Okay. That's correct. Getting guess with some sort of flying ability, maybe like 
is super light so it can glide on air or the jet streams or something like that. Okay, Chuck, would you like to guess? I, I think I'll pass. Okay. I'll just uh, I'll just give this to Dan. <laughs> <laughs> There's actually three people uh, that were airwave. I think this is a Marvel character. I should have wrote that kind of stuff down. But Larry, who was airwave at one point, uh, had an antenna in his helmet and circuit, er, circuitry in his belt which allowed him to eavesdrop on police band frequencies <laughs> or intercept telephone calls and travel at the speed of electricity along telephone lines on collapsible skates built into his boots. Magnetic energies enabled him to climb walls or relieve criminals of their guns. I don't know how the hell that goes with airwave, but <laughs> I guess since he's on the airwaves of the radio, I guess <laughs> that's well, kind of a str- We're on the airwaves of podcasts. Uh, (laughs) Apparently, we can also all be called airwave. Um, (laughs) Then there's Helen, who also has a helmet, which, well, no, yeah, also has a helmet, which allows her to change her molecular structure, can transform into energy, and travel along television airwaves, and can fly at superhuman speeds. So you've got that, Dan. So I'm counting that as a point for you. (laughs) Maybe the the one guy is is the guy from Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, you know, like. The kid that gets like sucked into the TV. And <laughs> it's just him as Mike a grown TV? up. Yeah, Ed TV. <laughs> and then the last character is uh, Harold, who is also able to ride and transmute into energy and fly at superhuman speeds. He inherited his powers and initially used his father's suit and helmet to better control his abilities. So apparently, Harold is Larry's son, from what I've have written here. Um, okay, and I think we're back to Chuck. Correct. Yeah, I think so. Okay, let's go with Wonderkin. Wonderkin? Wonderkin. Or Wunderkin, if you're exceptionally German. (laughs) Exceptionally Um, (laughs) German. I thought of Wonder Twins at first, but I know that's that's not it. No. I'm going to say a fake character. That is correct. Cool. Now, be careful with this one. You could be going, like, into some... Uh, really bad German territory where you could accidentally <laughs> piss somebody off. <laughs> some bad German territory? Let's see, Wonderkin. I'm thinking uh, this is someone that is a huge hit at their family reunion. All of the kin just say <laughs> that they are wonderful. <laughs> and there was a freak uh, chemical accident at a at a family reunion one year, and he developed the powers to uh, just grill someone whenever he wanted to. And everyone just calls him Wonderkin. I have no idea. <laughs> okay. Dan, would you like a shot? Uh, Wonderkin is... Uh, Wonderkin, I guess I would say then, is his dad was an SS fighter who trained him in the art of his fighting style and groomed him to be the true... German that Hitler really wanted his new race of you know Germans he was going after and he flooded his brain and gave him extra steroids he's basically German's answer to the Russian from the Rocky movie uh, also played by Dolph Lundgren surprisingly enough um, <laughs> <laughs> and he becomes Captain America's foe as he tries to re-enlist and start World War Three with new Germany and the new Nazis which are even more powerful and even bigger douchebags. So <laughs> I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give this one to you, Dan, because it was kind of a more realistic kind of what, what kind of a comic character that you would see out there kind of situation. So I'm going to give that one to Dan. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And I think this last one is actually for you, Dan. The name is serum. 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 Uh, wow. Uh, Serum. I could see that being some sort of mutant or something like that. So I will say that's a real character. Incorrect. Ooh, the first one that's wrong. Uh, yeah. But but there's there's still chances to to guess at it. Who who would like to to try to guess? Serum. Okay. Let me think. Serum is a man who has dedicated his life to taking down the evilness that is Jenny McCarthy and her. <laughs> And her stance against immunizations and trying to basically explain to her that she's a crazy person. Um, he has equipped himself with a special ability of not being an idiot. 
and he's trying to take her down as quickly and as smoothly as possible. So, <laughs> so, so Serum only has one supervillain, and, and that the, is Jenny McCarthy. <laughs> cannot think of a more powerful supervillain. <laughs> Okay. Uh, Chuck, would you like to take a crack at this one? Sure. I think Serum Serum was a guy who he was on a camping trip with his buddy. Unfortunately, his buddy got bit in the ass by a rattlesnake. <laughs> and he he had to suck the poison out. Oh, God. And then through some strange force of nature, he developed this immunity to the snake venom. And now he can produce at will a serum that will heal all people who are bitten by venomous snakes. You just need to bite them in the ass in order for it to work. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to go with that one because you said suck the venom out of his ass. (laughs) (laughs) I figured that would win me a point there. That was, uh... you hit Greg's soft spot. You know, Greg, that's not fair. (laughs) You know, I love sucking of asses. (laughs) I cheated a little bit to get that point, but (laughs) That's fine. And actually, you guys, you guys actually ended up in, in a tie where the points don't matter. So it's it's double as meaningless. <laughs> so over time, uh, no, I'm just Superman, Shootout. that's a real character. I win. I, I won't be able to guess his power set at all. <laughs> all of them. He just has all of them. <laughs> exactly. But. Weaknesses, fake dumb rocks. <laughs> but <laughs> but I, I, that was a lot of fun, Greg. Thank you for putting all the work in and getting that getting that taken care of. So hopefully we'll do that again, maybe with superheroes again, or there's a lot of possibility there, maybe with some movies or something like that. Yeah. Let, let us know in the comments, guys, if, if you want to hear more of that or, or something on similar, but different. <laughs> similar, but different. Uh, it, like that, but not at all. Uh, but <laughs> before we bring this episode to a close, we like to end each episode with a letter, a letter of support, a letter of criticism, you know, letters for different reasons. And my letter today actually is to a very, very, let's say, controversial or person. Hitler again? <laughs> no, no worse. Uh, <laughs> Justin Bieber. <laughs> oh, OK. <laughs> they're, they're similar. Very similar. Yeah. Uh, Hitler's more charismatic. <laughs> also is better at art. <laughs> and I'm going to say probably better singer. I'm just going <laughs> to. <laughs> Anyways, I apologize for all that. But before I get to my letter, I kind of want to explain where this comes from recently there was a video of justin bieber at court after his you know reckless driving he was finally arrested and brought in jail and there was a lot of him in court and him basically being an absolutely horrible person being disrespectful and all that and you know his life at this point he's we're finally seeing him and his career kind of just explode at the moment he's on his way of hitting hard times he's Done a lot of stupid things, a lot of bad press. His life has kind of gone downhill. Uh, He seems like he's having issues with drugs, apparently, and other issues. So what I was thinking is like, okay, I'm going to write a letter to to Justin Bieber and try to think of what is the information he needs to know in order to fix all of his problems. So I tried to take this seriously. I did some research. I looked at past childhood stars, what they did in order to overcome their issues, those that were successful, what they did in order to avoid those issues. I looked at all the issues that Justin Bieber was having, kind of m- mapped them out, did some serious research and thinking, okay, what is what are the key factors? If I were to eliminate those issues, how can he be a better person? You know, what would make Justin Bieber into a normal, everyday, likable human being? Like so Zero, after... Man. Getting all that information after collecting all that documentation, putting it all together, finally came up with this letter. So here it goes. By following these steps, I think Justin Bieber can finally fix all of his problems. Dear Justin Bieber, stop being a douchebag. Sincerely, (laughs) Dan. (laughs) (laughs) That's a lot of research there. Yeah, yeah. I think hours and hours spent <laughs> well I, spent <laughs> that was a lot of information that I, but I think he, he once he does that I think he'll be good but in all, in all seriousness I do have a letter actually a real letter and it's not to Justin Bieber though I do think he should take that device to heart it's more so to the people who get obsessed with him and celebrity culture in general if you go to like the grocery store and you look at all those horrible magazines and how it's just littered with gossip and garbage about this person has a drug problem. This person's breaking up with this with this person. It's just it's high school drama 
in a magazine form of people like instead of having popular high school kids, you have popular celebrities that we just can't get enough of. So this is a letter to all the people out there that get obsessed with that information and thinking of how we can kind of make this world a better place for all of us. So here it goes. There's no question we live in a celebrity obsessed culture. So much so we create celebrities for the most ludicrous reasons. Everything from sex videos to awful behavior on reality TV shows like Real Housewives of Slutvania or rich people's kids whose greatest achievement was being born because that's the last time they did anything for themselves. <laughs> the only thing our culture loves more than creating a celebrity is destroying one. Propping people up just to watch them fall is truly America's favorite pastime. Stars like Lindsay Lohan, Miley Cyrus, Amanda Bynes, Britney Spears, and so many others only see their spotlight grow as their life falls into shambles. Sure, when it comes to people like Justin Bieber, their fall is their own undoing. But it doesn't mean that we need to dedicate our lives to watching it take place. When CNN, a self-proclaimed news network, cuts away from talking to a U.S. congressman to talk about the arrest of Justin Bieber, we reach the apex of ridiculousness. The sad part is you can't even blame them because they're only giving us what many of us want. We don't want news. We want gossip of the highest order. Here's an idea, and it's simple. Let's stop caring so much about people's lives that we don't even know, especially ones that we've never met. Maybe that daughter of yours who thinks that fishnet stockings are formal wear, or that son whose favorite pastime is looking up the internet and finding racist epitaphs he can use when he's on Xbox Live, need you to talk to them for once in a while. Or maybe, you know, you can read a book instead of reading the, about the top 30 moments in celebrity cellulite history. What is missing all of this is the element of tragedy to a fallen celebrity overcome by the price of fame. I know poor them, all their money and all their fame. I get that. You'd love to have their problems and not have to worry about picking back your endless amounts of student loans. Still, there was once a kid there who had dreams of making it big. A kid not broken by an impossible system we created. Instead of treating them like a highway car accident that we can't look past, staring longingly at them in, the, in fire of destruction, let's leave them be. Let them work it out. Not give them attention. Not reward the worst possible behavior. Maybe then we get less Justin Bieber's, less Lizzie Lohan's, and less Paris Hilton's in the world. Which is something we can all agree on. Sincerely, Dan. Amen to that. <laughs> That is the epidemic across this country for sure. <laughs> but did you hear Selena Gomez is going back with him? Thank God, I was worried. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they can make it. You know what? Miracles can't happen. Is it me or does Justin Bieber look like a lesbian woman? I'm just. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I saw someone he on Facebook. Like Ellen at one point. It does. <laughs> I saw someone on Facebook had a picture going around that he looked like uh, the one character from the ghostbusters there <laughs> i could see that too but yeah. uh but before we go if you'd like to write a letter of your own or if you have a topic you would like us to talk about or a game or letting us know how you think of the podcast there's lots of different ways to get in contact with us you can send us an Sorry. email our address is feedback at geekcastradio.com just put in the subject line talking in circles or at talking in circles at live.com we're on twitter uh, just search talking in circles gcrn or on facebook uh, you can also follow me on Twitter. I'm at Movie Revolt. Or you can visit the episode post at geekcastradio.com. But before we go, you guys have anything to add before we end all this? No, nope, I'm good here. Now, do you want me to repeat Daniel Stern peeing thing? Shake <laughs> your lizards, let them drain. Move your hips and spell your name. Send it straight, send it hard. Now is third fight. Go on guard. Eat your veggies, eat your starches. Lean back, boys. Golden arches. No, I'm That's hungry. what you were looking for, right? You were looking for round two of that. <laughs> I'm always <laughs> looking for round two of Golden Arches, Greg. <laughs> uh, uh, but anyways, I'd like to thank you all out there for joining us again for this week. We will hopefully we'll see you again next week at the same time, same channel, same podcast network. But for now, this has been Chuck. This has been Greg, not Justin Bieber. And this has been Dan. And we've been talking in circles. We will see you next week. It's a more energetic one there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I felt it was more. <laughs> very frisky, very frisky, Greg. I'm a very frisky person, I guess. I'm sucking off <laughs> asses, so now I gotta be. Frisky, are we? <laughs> <laughs>
his dad was a classic SSS, or not an SSS. That, that's the <laughs> really, really good SS. It was the extra one. They got two S, three S's. Um, his dad was an SSS. Wow, I did it again. All right. His dad was an SSS. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, SSS, son of a son of a bitch. Are we off to commercial yet? Not yet. Wait for it. Are we there? No. Hold on. Now. No. Hello. I don't know. Joker here. Oh, that's a knee slapper. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs>